all the more from uh, the activity here week by week. Um, all right. Um, is justification a declaration or a process? Uh-huh. It's a declaration. All right. Is, uh, is righteousness confer the righteousness conferred, is it infused or imputed? imputed. And what's the difference? Yes. Yeah. See, it, it, with imp, with the imputation, you're being credited with a righteousness. You're not being given a righteousness um, or a righteous uh, essence um, inserted into your soul, a, as it were. All right. Well, how does the doc, uh, doctrine of adoption affect our understanding of the Christian life? All right, so why do you obey? Because we want to please a loving father. Right, to please. You're pleasing your father. What, what, what else? We're his sons, and so we uh, have this chastening in the family. Okay, so suffering is transformed, and we understand it to be fatherly discipline. Training us. Discipline and training. Uh, what else? Prayer. Prayer, yes. You're talking to people. Yeah, you're talking to your, your father. Uh, anything else? Shared inheritance with the son. And co-heirs with Christ. Communion with the saints. That's not one of my categories, Matthew. I'm coming in from the outside. That has to be wrong. <laughs> yes, sir. Just develop that thought for us. Yeah, so it's it uh, it alters our view of, of um, heaven and eternity, doesn't it? It does. Okay. Um, sure. So it's sort of call it. Yeah, like with fetish yet. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, and what else? Somebody else? I heard. Spell fetish yet. Yeah. No, I won't even try. <laughs> uh, what, what else? Communion. Right. Right. So uh, our fellow believers. You know, they are brothers, they are bros and sisters. An outlook, inheritance, heaven, co-heirs. All right, confusing justification with sanctification, making justification a blank is an error of Roman Catholicism. Process. Process, yes. Confusing sanctification with justification, making sanctification a blank is the error of higher life, Keswick, Second blessing, Methodist theologies. Uh, yeah, well, point yeah, point in time, instantaneous, um, something that happens in a moment. Yeah, it's, a, it's not quite a declaration. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a thing that happens in a moment of time, instantaneous. Uh, um, doesn't fill in the blank very good, though, does it? Making sanctification a, what's the best word to put in there? Yeah, okay, it's two words. Something that happens in a moment of time. You experience the second blessing, the second outpouring of grace where you um, achieve a new le level of, in the Christian life. Uh, okay, what is justification? justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace whereby he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Um, you all seem to struggle with that one just a little bit. Um, I think you must be lagging on your memorization. Is that... Might that be correct? Okay, so what is sanctification? Sanctification is the work. All right, stop. So, so that's, a, that's a critical difference. 
Justification is an act. Sanctification is the work, not an act of work. So again, the difference between justification and sanctification. An act, a declaration is justification. Sanctification is this ongoing work. So sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. It's that whole process of putting sin uh, to death. Okay. So let's, let's press on. That, that is, that is a, a picture of uh, the whole idea of being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You know, it's a putting this thing on that is not inherent in you, something that is alien and external to you. Um, that is not your own, it's, it's, it belongs to another and you're getting credited with it. And we think, and I think clothing is a good metaphor because then, uh, you know, in terms of our picture language, it was, God looking on us sees the righteousness of Christ because we've been clothed in that righteousness. Put on Christ. Yes? Where, where would that clothed, yeah, where else would that clothed language come from? Well, the put on, put off language of Ephesians and Colossians uh, would be, you know, suggestive of that. Put on. Right, the Joshua, the dirty priest, being clothed. No? Well, well uh, Joshua the, is a filthy priest being accused by Satan uh, uh, before God, and then uh, God clothes Joshua uh, with his own garments. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, you could go to Adam in the, in the garden being clothed with uh, God putting animal skins on him, you know, blood sacrifice clothed with these. That's not far-fetched, you know. They, they were naked and ashamed, and, and God uh, provides an animal sacrifice and clothes them in the skins of the animals. Okay, Tom? In, in, in the law, there's a concept called legal fiction, where, 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 where something isn't the truth, but the court is going to act as if it were the truth. Is, 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 is God acting as if we were righteous, as opposed to us? All, all I can tell you, Tom, is that the theologians, the Orthodox, want to have resisted calling it a fiction. You know, so because it, it is, there is a, there's an underlying reality to it. You are counted as righteous. Um, you are, in God's sight, righteous. So I, I, I think there's been some resistance to calling that a fiction. But I understand what you're saying. It's similar. Yeah. It's similar. It is, it, it's not a fiction because Jesus accomplished it. Mm-hmm. He paid the debt. He also lived the life. It's credited. Okay. All right. Let's go on to um, saving faith. So the question is, what is the source of saving faith? This is question uh, 19. Explain faith in both its broad and narrow senses. So chapter 14 says, The grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe... So what was that question? Source? Faith, faith is something that the elect are enabled to, to exercise, not something that we have of ourselves. That's the implication of that word, right? You are enabled, the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in there. Whose work is it? It's the work of the Spirit of Christ. If I have faith, it is not of myself, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is wrought ordinarily. So we have said a number of times, haven't we, that that is a very important Presbyterian word. Ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word. So that, that, that ordinarily 
uh, word helps us because it tells us what we can expect based almost all of the time while it allows for some exceptions because God is God. So ordinarily, how does uh, the Spirit of Christ enable us to believe? He says, ordinarily, the confession says, that's wrought by the ministry of the Word. There's means. Oops, get it down here. Ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also, and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer, is increased and strengthened. So it ordinarily comes by the ministry of the Word, the Word being preached, the Word being read, and then, then that, that, that faith is then strengthened, uh, and increased by the sacraments and prayer. So there, there are the three primary means, means of grace. Uh, and there'll be more about that later. So how is it that this, this how, we talked about this I think last time, how do we get the benefit of what Jesus did long ago and far away? Ordinarily, it's the Holy Spirit taking through the ministry of the word, taking those benefits of Christ and bringing them across all that space and all that time to us here in the present moment. He does that through the ministry of the word. So the benefits of Christ are brought to us by the spirit of Christ, working through the word so that what happened long ago and far away um, comes to benefit us. The spirit then working faith in us uh, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears. So, so you know, uh, Amazing Grace. That's a classic hymn on the subject. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What saved a wretch like me? Ama grace saved. Uh, God's grace saved me. I once was lost. Did I find myself? No, I was found. I was blind. Did I make myself see? No, I was blind, but now I see. So the passive voice is being used. I'm being wrought upon. Amazing Grace. God, by his grace, is opening blind eyes, softening hard hearts, uh, opening deaf ears, um, creating a, a disposition of receptivity to the meaning of the gospel, giving me understanding so that I then freely embrace Christ as Lord and Savior. So it's ordinarily by the word, increased and strengthened by the sacraments and prayer, the three primary means of grace. And then the second part of this, the broad and narrow senses, I think this is a very important passage, um, and, and, and this is a point at which I think my, my uh, campus crusade exposure in college uh, was effective because they, they, um, they tried to there distinguish between, you know, it was called, I think they called it airplane faith, you know, excuse me? What is that? Well, you know, you get on an airplane and you're, you're you know, you know, 300 and 64 days out of the year, you're just a pagan, and you get on an airplane, and you're just trusting God for a safe flight. You know, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm trusting God that uh, the plane's not going to crash. What they really mean is they're kind of trusting Boeing or, you know, um, Gulfstream. Uh, so, so airplane faith, or, or, or that, uh, or they just mean they believe in God in kind of generic sense. Yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe God, you know, everything happens for a purpose, and I believe that God, you know, God is in charge and all that. So the gen general kind of faith in God. The confession wants to distinguish saving faith from this generic kind of faith or kind of vague or um, generalized kind of belief in God and a vague kind of trust in him. So it says, by this faith a Christian believeth to be true whatever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein. Uh, so, so, you know, we were approached by some elders uh, to start the start a church in Beaufort, and we worked with them. But but uh, we found we found among those elders who had been in a PCUSA church all their lives, basically, that they knew they they knew the creed was true. Um, they believed the Bible was true, so they they believed the creed, they believed the Bible, but did they have personal trust, faith in Christ? That was not clear. And there, th th this is the confession getting at. There is a difference between this, this again, generic kind of faith in God and, and even belief that the Bible is true and affirming the creed. That is not quite the same thing 
as confessing that you're a sinner and submitting and surrendering to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So, yeah, yeah, so, so we can talk about faith. By this faith, th these are some of the characteristics of it. You know, you believe whatever is true, uh, believe to be true whatever is revealed in the word uh, for the authority of God himself speaking therein and, and, and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But, I want to make sure this is clear. Confession wants you to be, uh, you know, un uh, unambiguously clear about this. But the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. So there's that broad sense of, of faith where, you know, you believe the Bible, believe the creed, believe in God, believe in Jesus, um, but it's not, it's not specific, it's not particular, it's not, it's not focused, it's not in Christ himself, and, and, uh, the, and, and uh, the soul has, uh, within saving faith, the soul has, has dealt with Christ himself by repenting of sin and calling upon him for salvation. So there's that, that Christ focus of saving faith. So I, I've, I encounter this all the time in new member interviews where, you know, we'll ask, we'll ask of new members why, um, do, um, you know, this kind of the uh, why do you think you'll go to heaven questions. And the, the, the answers, it's, it's uh, instructive the kind of answers that you get because not, not infrequently we do get the kind of generic, well, I've always believed in God. I said, well, yeah, but uh, how, uh, you know, what about your sin? Well, yeah, yeah well, I, I repent of my sin. Well, why should God, you know, I say, I have, I have to prod. Why, why should God forgive you for your sin? Well, because he promises to do that. Well, so does God just wink at sin? I mean, what, is he like the unjust judge who lets the rapist go off and the murderer go off? I mean, what, well, how, how, you know, so, um, you know, and they said, well, you know, and they get confused and they said, well, what about Jesus? Oh, yeah, 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 he died for our sins on the cross, you know, and so they, but it's, a tr it's troubling because there isn't a Christ-centered response to what, wh how is, why will God let you, filthy you, I don't use that word, but, you know, sinful you, why would he let you into heaven? Heaven is a pure and perfect place. Why is he going to let you in there to corrupt it? Why, well, so how do you get in? Why do, the, why do the gates of heaven open up for you? And what, what you're listening for, what you want to hear somebody say, well, I, not because of anything I have done, but because Jesus Christ is my Savior. And, and because of his death, and I've put all my trust and I've repented and put all my trust in him, uh, God is going to forgive me and, and he's, he's, I'm reconciled to my maker and I have the gift of eternal life. So there is that, and that's what's really being driven home here. It's accepting, receiving, see, see the language, the different uh, Participles being used to describe what this means. It's accepting Christ. It's receiving Christ. It's resting upon Christ. For what? For justification, sanctification, eternal life. By virtue of the covenant of grace. Jerry, I want to make sure I understand the terminology of broad and narrow. And <clears throat> so in paragraph two, where it, where it describes... Um, Believing to be true, whatever is revealed in the Word, um, for the authority of God Himself, it does call that this faith yeah. by this right. Faith. All those things are true of saving faith, but all, all those things are not what saves. What so saves is saved. this thing at the end. But that's that is saving faith, but in its broadest yes. sense. Yes. Yes. In its narrow sense, it's resting on Christ, trusting, believing, yes. trusting. Yes. Yes. To. to, to it, in other words, the confession is getting very specific here about what it is. These are the characteristics. These, all these other, these are all characteristics of saving faith. But what particularly makes saving faith saving is not all these other things, but this specifically: this uh, accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life. So then, paragraph three: this faith is different in degrees, weak or strong may be often and many ways assailed and weakened, but gets the victory. Growing up in many to the attainment of full assurance through Christ, 
who is both author and finisher of our faith. So I think I treated you to a great quote somewhere in the middle of all this. Um, Didn't I? Uh, Somewhere somewhere from Watson saying, it's not the strength or weakness of your faith, it's whether or not you are laying hold of a strong Christ who is able to save. Um, Okay, so just by way of further explanation, um, the, um, the medieval theologians defined faith as knowledge and assent. So uh, these are the Latin words be- behind it, knowledge, assent, or assensus, uh, trust, or fiducia. So they did not include this third aspect. It was the Reformation then that came along and added fiducia, resting, trusting, personal, in other words, uh, knowledge and assent to, to what you know to be the case, those, those alone are not enough. It, ha- it must go on beyond that to personal uh, trust. So also the medieval church codified in, in, the, um, in the Council of Trent said that, in fact, it wasn't faith um, in Christ that was necessary, but in, they even... Um, uh, they even created a space for what they called implicit faith. That if one trust, trusted in the church as teacher, one would be saved. You know, of course, there may be the time in purgatory and all that. But that a, an individual doesn't need to understand the gospel or their sin or understand anything at all. But uh, they, they, they trust the church that, that what the church is true, what t- what church teaches is true, and if if uh, if uh, if one trusts the church as as the source of truth, that is saving that is saving faith. So not only was knowledge plus assent the definition that came out of the Middle Ages, but the knowledge and assent was not even per- knowledge of the gospel per se, but knowledge or tr- or or, or uh, assent to the to the church and its teaching role as as being the the source of truth. Okay, so the Reformation comes along, and, and it says, no, no, you must have fiducia, trust, personal trust. There must be this personal response to Christ, personal trust in Christ as Savior, not trust in the, te- in the church, but trust in Christ. And uh, the, the, there must be both the, the knowledge of, of the gospel, tr- tr- uh, 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 assent to what the gospel says about us as sinners and about Christ as a sufficient Savior, and then the personal response of repentance, faith, trust, rest in in him. So so part of the background to this um, emphasis on this third element, uh, you you can go to places like James 2.19, you believe that God, that there is one God or that God is one good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. Okay, so that's pretty illuminating. The demon, what do the demons know? Well, they know these two things up here. They, they have knowledge. They know it's the truth. I mean, the first beings that identified Jesus, you know, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy upon us. They were the first to, to you know, they, they beat the apostle Peter to the punch. You know, they, 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 they uh, had knowledge of his identity. They assented to it. They believed uh, that he indeed was that. What He, he was what he claimed to be. Uh, But were they saved? No, because there wasn't any trust. There wasn't repentance, faith, real trust, a turning to him, resting in him, surrender to him. That's the element that was uh, that was missing. Uh, So believe in what? In the Lord Jesus, not in the church, but in Christ himself, and you will be saved, you and your household. Uh, John 1, 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who b- did receive him, that is Christ, and who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. So it is, it is faith in Christ that saves. All right, question number 20. What is true repentance? And identify its three elements.
All right, so here's the confession statement on it. Repentance unto life is an evangelical grace. The doctrine whereof is to, preach, is to be preached by every minister of the gospel as well as that of faith in Christ. So what are we doing here? Are we adding another qualification for salvation? Are you justified by faith alone or not? So it, when, you're t when you add repentance as, um, as that, uh, that is necessary and to be preached as well as that of faith, are we adding something to sola, sola fide? Yes. Yeah. It seems like repentance is more of a fruit of the faith. I would say more that it's, um, it, it's part of it. it. That's part of what defines what faith is. Same coin, two sides of the same yeah. coin. Yeah, I think that's, that's more, that's, uh, I think, a more accurate way to describe it. It is the fruit of faith, but... There's another way to think about this that I think is correct, and that is that it's the two sides of the same coin. So um, if I weren't being filmed right now, I'd be walking back and forth showing you something. So I'll stand in place and try to show. So you have Joe Lost, all right? Joe Lost is on the, the broad path that's leading to destruction, all right? He's, he's marching along, um, you know, gospel light is shining, and he hates the light. That's what Jesus said, John 3, 19. He, he, he's a lover of the darkness, a hater of the light. And he's a shine, you know, the gospel light is shining. He's sh sh shielding his eyes as he's continuing on the broad path. And he likes the broad path. He loves the broad path. It's a wonderful thing. He's having a good time. He's partying up all the time. Um, as how does Joe Loss get turned around? Okay, so through the ministry of the word, um, his heart is transformed. He hears the gospel. The initial resistance is overcome. His heart is changed. He receives Christ. What does that uh, saving response look like? All right. It is turning from sin to Christ. It's a single act. Turning from sin, the word we use for that is repentance. Clean, the turning to Christ is faith. So, so I want, if I want to be saved, what am I being saved from? I'm being saved from my sin, not in my sin. I want to be saved from it. I want to be saved from its guilt. I want to be saved from its corruption, its bondage, its control. It is a repudiation of sin. So it necessarily saving faith involves the turning away from the sin to Christ. I can't grab hold of Christ if I'm still grabbing hold of my lust and my idols. So I'm releasing the lust and idols, and I'm grabbing a hold of Christ, that's a, that's a unitary act. It's a single movement from the sin from which I want, I desire to be saved to the one who is able to save me. So this, that's the way the confession treats this. So here, paragraph two, I think, I think helps us. By it, a sinner out of the sight and sense not only of the danger, uh, in other words, it's not just fire insurance. It's not just the fear of hell. It's more than that. But, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God and upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ to such as are penit penitent so grieves for and hates his sin as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. And then uh, paragraph three, well, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's stop there. Um, a very similar language in the shorter catechism, repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God does with grief and hatred of his sin turn, sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. So in, in terms of, of uh, the, um, the elements that I'm asking for in this question, ad identify its three elements. I, I see those three elements as consisting of agreement. So the word confess, if you confess your sins, that's the word homologeo. Uh, hom, hom, homa is, is, um, is uh, same. same, one, and legeo is word, the same word, the same. It's to say, it's to say the same thing.
say the same thing as who? To say the same thing as God. You're recognizing that, you know, the whole span of the, what the gospel requires of us. You're recognizing, you're confessing your sin. Uh, you, you, you are confessing the sufficiency of Christ and his death for our sin. So it's agreement, confess, homiligeo. Uh, then um, there is the element of grief. Uh, so we have the, the language of James uh, 4, 9, and then also 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11, where the Apostle Paul and then the James before him is, is talking about the depth of grief and sadness and sorrow uh, in, in, in a situation of sin that is being e expressed. So I'll, I'll read James 4, 9. He says, a 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Or you can go to places like Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 where you see there is a, a, an, an emotional um, uh, element to true confession of sin where one is grieved for what one has done. So I, I, I can illustrate it this way. Let's say, uh, let's say there's an individual, he's committed adultery against his wife, it's been discovered, and he's trying to repair his marriage, and so he goes to her and he says, uh, uh, look, uh, Susie, uh, I'm sorry I broke my vows, and um, you know, I violated my vows, violated the marriage, and I want you to forgive me. And she says, uh, well, you know, I'm really struggling with it. And, and he says, well, what, do you, what do you want? I said I was sorry. Well, what's the deal? Um, well, you know, that, that I'm deeply wounded by that. Well, what do you want, blood? Uh, uh, the Bible says you're supposed to, and he quotes the Bible to her. The Bible says you're supposed to for, forgive people when they come to you and ask for forgiveness. Okay, what, what's wrong with that husband's confession? <laughs> Yes. Well, okay, but even it's, it's not proficient, not propitiatory in yeah. any way. There's no satisfaction. He's There's no done, undone, undone. Right, broken. right, right. So, is not really there. right. So, where there's real repentance, there's grief for the wrong that has been done. Isn't that the case? If you if you confess at a superficial level like that, your those are just empty words. You don't understand what you've done. You don't understand the harm that's been done. You don't understand the, the sadness. In other words, there's a kind of an emotional restitution that takes place when there is real repentance. And I'm using that word guardedly. But there is a kind of emotional, you grieve like you cause the grief. And, you know, in the same way, if you steal, you know, $100, you pay the $100 back plus interest, you inflict the wound, then where there's real repentance, there is a, there is a, 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 equivalent level of grief for the, the crime that has been done, the sin that has been committed, and the hurt that you have caused. You grieve that you have hurt the, hurt the organization, hurt the institution, hurt the wife, hurt the children by the sin that has been committed. So where there is real, um, where there is real confession, there's going to be this element of, of grief. So you know, this sense of his sin with grief and hatred of his sin. And then change. So the, the actual word that's, re, that, that's translated in the New Testament uh, is metanoia, uh, which means uh, to, change, to change the mind. Meta is change and noia is thinking or mind, to change the mind so that one's thinking is changed, so that it is, there's an engagement of... of, uh, of uh, the, the mind and the emotions and the will. In other, words, in other words, where there's real repentance, there is this total personal response. So I'm, when I repent, I change my thinking, my outlook, my direction, my course. I, I begin to head in a, di a different direction. So with the mind, I confess, I grieve, and I change. I, I alter the direction. Joe saw a loss. He turns around where there's real repentance. He forsakes, he abominates the sin, he forsakes it, he turns from it. Yes? Um, how, how could we apply that to 
know, someone younger, like a child or a, a young child who's professing faith? Or well, oh, not, 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 not how do I know when my children were really repentant? Yeah, yeah, you can say that. Yeah, I, I knew exactly when they were really repentant. Because they cried. <laughs> they they were angry and defiant, and, as opposed to being broken over it. But you're asking a different question. Well, I guess. Well, I, I, so, so take a lesser offense, um, you know, especially when the earlier years of our marriage, Emily and I used to have some pretty ferocious arguments. She was the youngest child, I'm the youngest child. Man, we would go at it. And, um, you know, and, and uh, she, 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 she's good with words. Um, and I would, I would get extremely upset and angry and could argue her down. And eventually, I would win. And she would break down and weep. And whenever that happened, I would immediately know what a total creep I am and would be utterly broken by it. All it took was her tears. And, I would, and, and that just gave me a window into my own dark heart, my own dark soul. And what am I doing? What an fool, what an idiot I am, um, that I would take my delicate flower and verbally abuse her like that and beat her up to the point that she just gives up and breaks down and weeps. What a bully. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, if I later said, hey, I'm sorry for yelling at you, that's one level, right? That's not very deep. But if I am able to say, I'm so, so sorry that I would ever bring you to tears, because I would be. I'd, be. I'd be completely broken by it. I'm so sorry. That, that's the difference I'm trying to get at, where you really are repentant. You really are they're emotionally broken by it. Yeah, that word earnestly comes in. Earnestly repent. Yeah. So, so here's, a, here's another one. What if, what if I'm um, guilty of drunk driving, but I don't get caught, and I don't get caught, and I don't get caught? Eh, I feel kind of bad about it. I really shouldn't do that. Eh, it's dangerous. I shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. And then one day I get caught uh, and, and I get arrested. And then my picture's in the newspaper. And I'm the pastor of the church here. What do you, how do you think emotionally I would respond to the, uh, the event? It, it would be absolutely devastating to me that I would have brought dishonor and disgrace to Christ and his church by my foolish, self-indulgent, behavior, I, it would be another revelation of the darkness of my own heart, my weakness, my foolishness. Um, so that would be real repentance. The other one where it was, eh, got away with that, that, that's not real, that's not the real thing. I'm sure there could be. So, so I think the ungodly grief often is a grief, um, a sadness because of the consequences, not because of the sin, but because I got caught, um, uh, because uh, of remorse versus godly grief. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Like John Bunyan said, I repent of my repentance. Yeah, yeah, 
my repentance was so inadequate that I needed to repent of my repentance. Plus yeah. the, uh, I can't remember exactly how you say it, Lord, uh, change me, uh, but, not, but yeah. not yet. Yeah, that was Augustine's prayer. Yeah, Lord, deliver me from my lust, but not yet. I'm, I'm still enjoying it too much, and so let me get a little more out of this and then, and then change me. Yeah, that, that would not be real faith or real repentance. Yeah, yes? So how do you, like, balance, I guess, like, true grieving uh, with, with acknowledging that there is pardon for that sin so that we're not just always, like, beating ourselves up and depressed over it? Um, well, I would, just, I would say my first answer to that is kind of flippant. It is that, you know, I don't see a whole lot of people just grieving over their sin. I don't think that that's characteristic of our age. You know, I don't think we see the, the awful repentance of this 17th century, uh, you know, amongst the Puritans. Well, Bunyan, you, read, you want to read a depressing book, which I found it to be as a seminary student. I read it in England when I was, what, 23 years old, and I was Grace Abounding the Chief of Sinners by Bunyan. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on to trying to find peace and assurance, and he just can't get there. So I, I think it's, I, I, I don't know, I don't think you can quantify it. Um, I think that you can have, um, you know how at funerals you have sweet sorrow? When it's a believer, you have a, there's sorrow, but it's a sweet sorrow. You know it's a separation, but it's not permanent. And there'll be a reunion. And you're sad about the separation, but you know that one day you'll see that loved one again, and that's the promise of the gospel. So you're sad, but then, you know, then there's that. It's not grief like unbelievers' grief, like in 1 Thessalonians 4, those who have no hope. And I think godly grief, there's a sadness and a grief for the dishonor and the hurt and the pain and the suffering. But there's also the, on a bedrock of joy and peace and knowing that, yeah, I'm a sinner, but Christ is bigger than my sin. His blood covers the worst of my sin. I'm pardoned. I'm forgiven. I'm going to pick myself up and go on. Does that answer? Does that help? Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, I think in that scenario, it's in my mind, it's a little bit easier because that's more like an internal thing, whereas if it's you and your wife and maybe the internal grieving and forgiveness is on two different timelines, it could be challenging. Like if, if you're grieving what you did to your wife, you don't want to just wallow in that forever because you know you are forgiven and if you He may want you to wallow a bit longer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 and I, I do go back to, I think that there's an element of emotional restitution, and we all know it. Are you really, are you really sorry? Or are you just placating me? We're pretty good placators. I'll say the words I know that you want to hear, but we're not really all that sad about it. We're not sorry about it. We don't see it as sin. You're making too much of it. I mean, when I committed adultery, what's the big deal? We're like, we're like children who learn what it takes to cope and function and live and get by. You know, they learn what mom and dad expect, and they, and they deliver it because they know that's what it takes to keep moving forward and get by and cope in their life. And we're like that so much as well. We and know it, how to just do just... Just and in Christian homes, they learn all the right language, mm -hmm. too. So, yeah, they learn to say the words that they know that we want to hear. And, you know, your wife's the same way. Your boss at work's the same way. I'm just saying that when we know it's sin, you know, every, every morning when you pray, you praise God, and then you confess your sin. And thoughts, words, and deeds, they're all corrupt. You got a lot of them to deal with, and there should be sadness over the fact my my thought life is not more pure. My words are not more kind and uh, edifying. My 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 deeds they are hurtful and harmful. So anyway, where there's real repentance, there's going to be this grief and hatred of the sin, and a turning away from it. So it's a whole it's a whole person response. The mind, will, and the emotions are engaged where there is uh, true repentance. Um, 21, do I want to say more about 20? No, 20, 21 is, uh, what, um, may a person be saved apart from repentance, 
the repentance unto life mentioned in five, uh, 15, 1 to 4, why or why not? So let's go on and read some more sections. Although repentance be not, be not to be rested in. Sometimes this is street slang. Did you notice sometimes the confession goes into street slangs? Although repentance be not to be rested in as any satisfaction for sin or any cause of the pardon thereof, which is the act of God's free grace in Christ, yet it is of such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without it. So it's, uh, so I have in the margin here, it's not meritorious, but it is necessary. Well, you can't be pardoned from something unless you know what you're being pardoned from. So if, you're, if, you, don't, if you don't have that point where you're, you're repenting from something, then the pardon is for nothing. So that, that's part of explaining why it has to be there. Yeah, and it, it's going to go on with a particularly, particular great p phrase here that I think is helpful to us. As there is no sin so small but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it cannot bring damnation upon those, that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. All, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven. Uh, five men ought not to content themselves with a general repentance, but it is every man's duty to endeavor to repent of his particular sins particularly. That's what I love. I just love that phrase, your particular sins particularly. So that, that is to say that when we practice repentance, say, say in our private devotions, we, we don't just repent, forgive me all my sins, and move on. Forgive me all my sins, kind of in a flippant way, and just go on to the other thing. No, you really do try. Um, you, you try to evaluate. I think thoughts, words, and deeds are helpful. You think about, you know, you think about in terms of thoughts. Think about in terms of words. Think about conflicts that you've had, that, you know, things that where you have, uh, you have sinned against others or sinned against God or indulged the flesh or, you know, um, fed your lusts or, or um, you know, um, uh, you um, indulged your appetites uh, to a sinful degree. So um, it's not just forgive me all my sins. We're to repent of particular sins particularly and not just content ourselves with a kind of generic, Confession. So you will notice, I hope you will notice, that in the, the Sunday morning pastoral prayer, as well as the Sunday evening prayer of confession, we try to get specific. That I tell you, there, there's an art to it that I, I don't believe, I don't, I don't think of myself of having mastered, which is to be general enough that, they, that the confession applies to everyone, but be specific enough that it causes us to think and recall and to engage in true repentance. So the, 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 geni the genius of the Book of Common Prayer, Cranmer's uh, communion confession and then the daily confession is those generic categories which are comprehensive. Thoughts, words, deeds, evil done, good left undone. So there's commission, omission, and then um, and I think it's the communion then adds, um, adds these other categories um, of whether, um, whether, um, uh, whether through ignorance, weakness, or our own deliberate fault. Okay, ignorance, or I, di I didn't know it was wrong and I did it. Uh, it doesn't, ignorance doesn't excuse you. You're, you're, sin is sin, and even if you didn't know it was a sin, it's still. It's still. Through, so through igno ignorance, through weakness, yeah, I was overcome by a sudden temptation, violent, sudden, unanticipated uh, temptation, and I succumbed to it. It was a weakness, a momentary lapse, a weakness, and I, and I, and I gave into it. Or, which is the bigger problem, our own deliberate fault. With deliberation and forethought, having, ma having made, in the, in the languages at Romans 12, uh, having made provision for the flesh and its lust, planning Walking a path that you know is going to, is going to lead there. Um, but those, those confessions, I, 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 you know, I, I think I've told you, I went to England and the first six months that I was there, I was using the prayer book every day in chapel and every Sunday in church. And I hated the prayer book. I thought, you know, 3% of the population is in church on Sunday. And I said, well, it's no wonder. <laughs> I mean, you're using this medieval book. And it's boring as all get out. 
uh, and and it was it took me six months, but then at about the six month mark, uh, it was at a Sunday night communion service at the at the college that I uh, that, that hearing that prayer, I realized that that was that prayer was taking me to a depth I had never gone in all my life. And I realized then the genius of the prayer. And it, it has been, been a model for me ever since. Anyway, the com combination of the, the daily prayer and the communion prayer, thoughts, words, deeds, evil done, good left undone, um, whether through weakness or ignorance or our own deliberate fault. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. I mean that pleading. Have mercy upon us. Anybody know the next phrase? Miserable, Miserable offenders. There's somebody raised up an Episcopalican. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom? Yes. In fact, uh, you know, Father Ralston down the road here has said that that, was, that marked the downfall of the Episcopal Church when they took out the word miserable. When we were no longer miserable offenders, a threshold been, had been crossed by the, the Episcopal Church. And it, it's, it's, you know, why are we beating up on ourselves about our offenses? It's just weakness, you know. No, in the original uh, prayer, it's miserable offenders um, and the pleading for mercy. So as in a little superficial Southern California Christianity that I grew up with and matured with in college, that just took me to a depth I had never been, and I needed to go there. I needed to be there. Um, so I, 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 I highly value this chapter on repentance. Reciting the, reciting the law, reciting the Ten Commandments, does 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 a similar thing in making you recall and think of in particular offenses. Yeah, the first the first time that I used the Ten Commandments was as I think I I might have been still an intern or maybe I'd become an assistant minister or the youth director or something. It was down in Miami, and. Um, Okay, I'm a, I'm a rookie, and my, my convictions are half-formed. And, and we had a Reformation Sunday night service where we used uh, Calvin's uh, form of church prayers. And so we used the Ten Commandments as an introduction to the confession of sin. It was the first time I'd ever done that, first time I'd ever seen it, first time I'd ever experienced it. And it really hit me. It, it added a weight, a weightiness to that service. We never used it again, but it added this weightiness to it, gave it substance, and it's, it's just sobered. It sobered, I just felt like it sobered the entire room to go through that, and then Calvin's a very elaborated uh, confession of sin. But um, you know what, I've been blethering on here. Let's, uh, let's take a break, um, take a five-minute break.